Good morning. Good morning, Witherspoon family, Facebooks, go to meeting, our family members and friends. I want to welcome you to our fall men's health symposium with our featured guest, Dr. Derek Griffith of Georgetown University. I want to first of all thank Dr. Griffith for accepting so graciously accepting our invitation and even changing his schedule uh, for it. We really appreciate that, Dr. Griffith. At this time, just to go over uh, our schedule this morning, Elder Walton would introduce Dr. Griffith and his bio. Then uh, we would go into our format for our meetings, questions and answer after Dr. Griffith's presentation, and then we will have our closing by Dr. Reverend Winterborn Harrison Jones. But once again, I want to thank everybody for joining us. And one last note, you can find all of Dr. Griffith's handouts uh, on Witherspoon's website. That's wpcindy.org. You can find all of his handout, and I challenge each one of us to actually go in and look at it because there is some very, very interesting information that we all should be aware of. If it does not affect us personally, we know people in our family and in our communities that it can help. So once again, thanks everybody. Good morning, Witherspoon family, friends, and those who are tuning in this morning. Dr. Derek M. Griffith, he's a professor of health and a health systems administrator with Georgetown University in the Department of Oncology, Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center, founding co-founder, Georgetown Racial, Racial Justice Institute, founder and director of the Center for Men's Health Equity in the Racial Justice Institute. Dr. Derek M. Griffith is, as I mentioned already, co-founder of the Racial Justice Institute. And in addition to those things, he has completed two feature works, Men's Health Equity, which is a handbook, and Racism, Science and Tools for the Public Health Professional so important to look upon those items. Dr. Griffith was, is a trained in psychology and public health. Uh, his research program focuses on developing strategies to achieve racial, ethnic, and gender equity in health. Dr. Griffith is a contributor to, and editor to two recent books, The Men's Health Equity, a Handbook, and Race, Racism, Science and Tools for the public health professional. He has been interviewed for and quoted in national news outlets such as Ebony, National Public Radio, and the Washington Post. Dr. Griffith has co-authored or provided expert review of reports from the American Psychological Association, Prof Mundu U.S., and the World Health Organization. He has been the principal investigator of research program grants from the American Cancer Society, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and several institutes within the National Institutes of Health. Author of over 140 peer-reviewed manuscripts, 
Dr. Griffith serves on the editorial boards of the American Journal for Men's Health, Ethnicity and Disease Health Education and Behavior, the International Journal for Men's Social and Community Health, Psychology of Men and Masculinities, and Public Health Reports. And he has been a guest editor of a number of journals, special issues, or supplements. He's received three noteworthy honors, the Tom Bruce Award from the Community-Based Public Health Caucus of the American Public Health Association in recognition of his research on eliminating health disparities that vary by race, ethnicity, and gender. He was named a Fellow of the American Academy of Health Behavior for his significant contributions to the field of health behavior research, and he was named one of the 1,000 inspiring black scientists in America by the Cell Mentors Community of Scholars. As we mentioned twice, and also a third time just to focus on, his featured works are Men's Health Equity, a Handbook, and Racism, Science and Tools for the Public Health Professional. So we present to you this morning, Dr. Derek M. Griffith. Okay. I've gotten the okay from uh, our fearless leader, uh, so I'm going to forge on. Um, just saying thank you to all, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, let me just jump right in. Um, so today what I want to talk about is actually talk about uh, mental health, and I'm going to come at this um, from a slightly different angle and talk about it really through the context of stress. Um, we don't tend to think about stress being um, as big of a problem or as big of an issue um, as, as it really is, but it's really important to recognize that how important stress is in our lives and how important it is to recognize when you're experiencing stress and what implications that has for your health and well-being. One of the things that's important, or the, one of the main sort of key takeaways from my talk is that stress is not just rooted in doing things that are negative, but it actually is rooted in doing things that we see as positive and that we see as things that we want men to do and that usually we aspire to do as humans and particularly as men. And so a lot of the success that we have, both in terms of professionally, 
um, in terms of partnerships, as, as spouses, uh, families, um, all of those things that we really value can be sources of stress, and that we can we often tend to prioritize those things more than our health. And what I'm proposing to you is is to basically try to think about this as opposed to as opposed to the way we often approach it, which is to prioritize those things over our health. But we have to find a better balance between health and these markers of success. So, just a couple of quick examples. Um, I watch way too many, too much TV and way too many movies. Um, and one of the ones that speaks to me in, in relation to this is a movie called Click that was from about 15 years ago. And um, Adam Sandler was the, the protagonist in the movie. And he was really looking for a way to basically control his life a bit more. And he really was trying to actively manage his success. He was really, you know, driven at work and so forth, but also trying to figure out how he could also be um, an active parent, um, an active husband, and so forth, and really struggled with that. So his thought was that if he could create this universal remote to control his life, that that would help. The short version is that, of course, didn't work. The other movie, I don't think, from around the same time was this Pursuit of Happiness. But, and Will Smith was the, Will Smith and uh, Jamie Smith um, were the, the lead characters. And in the pursuit of happiness, Will Smith um, really puts all of his, and he's doing telling the story essentially of Chris Gardner, um, who was a real person who became homeless um, and was really trying to find a job and find his way into corporate America. And was really trying to decide, figure out, well, what does happiness really mean to him? What does happiness really look like? And one of the moments in there was, you know, he was really just driven, he was trying to get to an interview, and for all of, all of the different, you know, things that had happened, he goes to, finally gets this interview at a corporate company, a corporate firm, and there's a moment where he's the, the person who's interviewing him says, what would you say if a guy walked into an interview without a shirt on my heart? And his response was, he must have had on some really nice pants. And the, the point here of, of that versus these other things is he was so driven that he really didn't care. He knew he needed to be there. It was really important for him to show up and to try to overcome more than his appearance, more than what he sort of presented, and to just show it was really the person behind all of that that was really going to be the thing, regardless of how he looked on the outside. And so we have to really recognize that it is those deep, those things that are, are those things that are deeper in us that really drive these kind of moments, decisions, and activities. And that we have to balance that with our health in a better way than we typically do. So in the time that I have for you, with you today, I'm going to talk about four things. The challenges and mixed messages that we give, particularly men and black men in particular, about this idea of success and health. And then talk a little bit about some of the research that we've done that, that describes how black men talk about and think about health. And then talk about broadly some barriers to health, um, COVID and, and mental health in particular. COVID being one of those broadly, basically talk a little bit about racism and other things about that in our lives are challenges to prioritizing health. And then lastly, you know, how we need to think about an idea of self-care, which is, can be a little bit foreign to um, many of us as men, but nonetheless is important to think about even if you're not necessarily um, that comfortable with that term, doing something to take care of yourself and to make sure that you're, when you're not your best, to make sure that you get back to your best is an important thing to do, regardless of how you characterize it. So one of my favorite um, ads, and this is a real ad from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, um, came out, um, it's, it's been some years now, maybe close to 15, 20 years ago, where they were trying to get men to engage in preventive tests. And uh, this, obviously, as you can see, this says, this year thousands of men will die from stubbornness. And the tagline is, learn the preventive medical tests you need. And the assumption here is that the reason that, the connection is that men, you know, the assumption is the reason that men aren't getting um, the preventive tests they need, aren't going to the doctor, aren't taking care of themselves, is simply because we're stubborn, we don't want to, we don't care, it's just not a priority for us, and so forth. And while I'm sure that resonates with a lot of you and a lot of your spouses and a lot of your, um, the women in your lives, uh, that, that there's, an and there's an element of truth to that, 
what I'm going to hopefully do for you is characterize that in a little bit broader context and maybe offer some insight into why that's the case and hopefully uh, complicate that a little bit and hopefully help us see that there's a reason why men may not prioritize those kinds of things and it's not just due to struggles. So the assumption that um, being healthy is the goal is actually not one that everybody shares. So we all want to be healthy. I mean, if you ask people if they want to be healthy, of course they're going to say yes. Um, but the idea that that's the real goal that you have in life is not really true. But from a health standpoint, and as a health professional, we often treat health as though the goal of life and the goal of doing things in your life is to be healthy, and then everything else should come second. And we should prioritize our health over that. When in reality, you know, we're trying to be, again, um, successful in our careers and, and, and in jobs, and frankly, just keeping jobs. Um, you know, again, keep uh, marriages happy and healthy, trying to, you know, take care of uh, kids, take care of aging parents, take care of, you know, loved ones, family, and oh, not to mention getting involved and making sure that we're part of a, a faith community and larger community that can really help feed us and that we can, can pour into as well. And so this idea that health should be or is your top priority is just not one that really ends up panning out, yet we treat it that way with a lot of those messages like you saw in that ad. When we talk to men um, about sort of balancing health and other priorities, they're very clear that this is this is a real challenge. And that if you're a man, this is a quote from one of the men that we did um, an interview with some years ago, he said, if your man knows a family, your primary concern is providing for your family, your wife, and kids. Um, I know mine was, you know, and I'm sure that caused me some stress. And so that that's really the primary focus where his attention goes and so forth. It's not, oh, I need to take care of myself, what's my A1C level or my blood glucose, what's my blood pressure. All of those things are kind of in the background to do, am I taking care of these responsibilities that are really more important and that I'm able to do in service of the people that I love and the way that I show love is to, is to be of service in those ways. And this idea of choosing between going to the doctor and um, spending money to do things that would be helpful to himself in terms of work and so forth is the second quote where there's a man making a choice between or saying that if he had the choice between going to the doctor um, and spending the $400 on fixing his car, he's going to definitely fix the car for a variety of reasons that we actually probably in a larger context would, have, would value and appreciate. So, and that's kind of the odd complexity, and that's why I call it the paradox of manhood, is because there are a lot of things that when we say it just on the surface, that we say, oh, well, clearly he's going to prioritize his health, and he needs to spend that money on, you know, himself and take care of himself. But on the other hand, if he's limited, if he, his family can't get around because that's their only car, he can't get his kids to school, all of those kinds of things, then it puts him in a different context, and those are the kind of challenges that men are facing to be able to make those kind of decisions. The, other, the next big thing is, I want to make this a little more pointed, um, this idea of mental health is something that we don't fully appreciate. And there's a very interesting documentary called King in the Wilderness, and it's about, about the last 18 months of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s life. And, um, and, and what's fascinating about this, and one of the parts that's really important to note in there, is they talked about um, Andy Young, um, and others talk about the, the, the mental health and they were really seriously concerned about Dr. King and his mental health and because of the amount of stress that he was under in trying to be successful in his community, still trying to be a father, still trying to be a husband, trying to do all of the things that he was doing, he had burned, he essentially was burning himself out and they were about to actually, um, they were really concerned that his, he, he was not going to be able to continue at that pace to say it minimally and that he was really going to need to take a sabbatical or rest or break of some kind for him to really be able to function. They were really, you know, genuinely concerned almost to the point of needing to have him um, committed to, it is to at least, not necessarily a mental health institution, but at least to, you know, basically require him to sit down and take a rest and take a break because his mental health and stress was so bad. And it was so so in his body. One of the other things that um, came out, not necessarily in this, but in his autopsy, one of the things you can look at sort of um, the age of 
of different organs and, and so forth in the body, um, his heart was um, basically, the, his body had aged to the point where it looked like he was at least 20 years older than his chronological age. So even though he died at 39, was murdered at 39, his body and music, his heart was functioning at the level of what you would expect a 60 year old to function at. And it was because of the stress, we attribute it to the amount of stress that he was under. So the point here is, even though he was doing things, that clearly we recognize and remember him as for all of the wonderful things that he did. He's certainly one of my heroes as well. One of the things that's important is his, his and we remember the positives about him. We don't remember the stressors, the struggles, and all of those kinds of things. We remember all of the positives of what he left us as a legacy. We don't tend to focus on all the negatives and so forth that may have happened or his mental health and health. And so my point here is, despite the fact that, you know, a certain, you know, his physician may have said, well, you really need to, you know, sit down, um, take a break. It's really, you really, this is not really an option for you to continue to go at this pace and continue to travel as much as you did and do all the speaking and mobilizing events that he was doing. He really had to, he wasn't prioritizing and finding a good balance between those two. And the point here is we value him for that. We value him for making that priority and making that sacrifice of himself to be able to be successful for others and for the rest of us. And that's part of the message of, again, going back to this idea of success. We value men for their, for their sacrifice, and we appreciate men for taking those sacrifices, making those sacrifices, and almost define men as being successful because we sacrifice in those ways. And yet we have these messages where we're trying to get men to say, well, no, don't sacrifice your health, your well-being, and so forth, and, you know, prioritize, you know, prioritize, don't do that. You need to prioritize your health, manage your stress better, manage your mental health better, and so forth, and that those things are uncomfortable. We, you know, and so it's trying to find that balance between those. Um, one quick illustration just to make this really concrete is a story that I'm sure is familiar to this audience of John Henry. And um, John Henry, of course, was known as the steel driver man. His, his job was to bore a hole in the mountains to basically be able to put explosives so that they could um, blow, um, basically, forward a path through mountains to basically um, create a space for steam engines and the railroad to move through so that you know progress could happen and so forth. And he was recognized as being one of the strongest men who'd ever lived, one of the best at his job, if not the best at his job. And um, so there came this opportunity for saying, well, is he better than the um, technology of the time, the steam engine? So this is this a man versus machine kind of conflict. And so he took on the, um, uh, the, the steam engine and, you know, had this race, you know, on the tracks. In some versions of the story, he actually was married and had a son and both his, his son and wife were on the tracks watching him um, when this uh, this race happened. And as you know from the story, he won. And so, you know, a very triumphant story. But the part that we often forget is that wasn't the end of the story. He dies right on the tracks. Um, and, but we remember him, he dies right there on the tracks and we, you know, recognize and we still tell the story, but usually we leave it as the positive story of an Andy machine, you know, the power of an individual and so forth. So what do we learn from this? And what does this have to do with what we're talking about in terms of health and stress and priorities? Well, he was very great. He was, you know, if you, if you take this and put it into a contemporary context, we, and, and I'll put myself in this as well, um, tend to prioritize our work over our health. And we are valued for that. And again, his strategy here was to try to just work harder. Let me just put my head down, let me just focus, let me not take breaks, let me not try to be strategic about how I'm doing, what I'm doing, let me not even take on this challenge or task because maybe it's not even necessary for me to do, and it's not worth it given the other priorities and responsibilities that I have. And his, he was successful, so we can't sort of ignore that. It wasn't as though he was, um, you know, he was he was the best at his job. But his success and the way he prioritized his success and the way he was driven to create to be successful 
was what potentially lost the cost of his life. And so the fact that he focused more on his professional success and his own health, we, you know, and again, this is the paradox that while it would have been nice for him to, you know, have prioritized his health, taken care of himself and so forth, not taking on these kind of challenges, the, way, the reason that we remember him is because he took on this challenge, because he prioritized his, his profession and his success in his profession more than his own health. And so this is the mixed messages that I was talking about that we tend to get as men and that we tend to internalize as men around this idea of health and well-being. Um, this concept was um, explored even further by um, another mentor, um, who I'm sure Dr. Bill with Anderson knows well, uh, Sherman James, um, who coined this idea of John Henryism. And so he had this story, um, he took that story and actually found a real person in, um, I believe it was North Carolina, where he was, and um, talked about this, this, what he called high effort coping, or basically this idea of the way that I'm going to overcome the challenges that I face are basically not to do anything other than to put my head down and just work harder. And when there was this idea that it was representative of these particular personality traits, like tenacity or this, again, your willingness to really commit yourself to working hard, the energy and attention, the mental and physical vigor, and a commitment to hard work, which again, if you look at these, these are not bad things. These are, these are attributes that we want men to have. Yet, these are the things that are associated with men actually um, having worse health outcomes in some case, because if we don't balance that with taking care of our health as well. What does this have to do with success? Well, this idea that, you know, if we do this hard work and sacrifice, and that that's going to lead to success, particularly professional success, and that somehow or other that's going to lead us to happiness. And part of what I'm trying to get us to question is whether or not that is, is in fact true. Um, yes, all of those things are necessary, all of those things are important, but is that the only thing that is going to lead to happiness is really the better question that I should have asked. Just so you don't think I'm only stuck in the past with these stories, um, these are more recent stories and illustrations, um, particularly from the realm of football, uh, which again, I watch way too much, um, but nonetheless, um, it's, it's, we see, we've seen these um, incidents where when they were trying to change the NFL rules around how to um, hit within football, that they were trying to reduce the concussions and reduce, you know, head trauma and so forth. Um, and CTE and all of those kinds of things that they were encouraging players to stop hitting or to really try to penalize them for hitting basically waist up and to start trying to get them to hit sort of essentially waist down. And what happened is a lot of the players, uh, or not a lot, but certainly it came out that several players were really um, not on board with that. Even though it was in their best interest, they were trying to protect their long-term health and well-being protect their long-term interests, they said things like they would rather have more concussions than leg injuries. And you pause for that, and then there's another one that I have here that I'd rather have a guy hit me in my head than I hit my knee, because it's going, it could be lead to a career in the injury um, if I'm able, if I have a knee injury, then I can't play football anymore. And so you think about this, we step back at this, you know, those of us who are not you know, professional football players, and this is not the way that we make our lives and money. And we said, well, why would you, is it, that makes no sense. Why would you choose to prioritize your um, short-term career? You know, these careers for NFL players maybe last three or four years, or most of them, everybody's not Tom Brady, so they don't play for 20 plus years. But it's it's like you have this, you're gonna prioritize your, your whole, your, your health and well-being, you're going to sacrifice that long-term, you know, ability to function, have, you know, good cognitive functioning, being able to do things in your life, or the short-term success of being able to say that, uh, to be a professional football player and to be successful in that space. And what I'm suggesting is we, we although many of us, most of us are not professional football players or professional athletes, we tend to make similar sacrifices where we're willing to sacrifice the short-term gain of being successful in our chosen profession, in our chosen career, in our chosen priorities, in ways that, um, in ways that that help that we 
think about um, prioritizing those issues over our long term, what's necessary for our long term health and well-being. And that that's part of the challenge that we're face. Um, some of the stressors that come with these, in addition to just the ways that we prioritize, I also want to put this in a larger context. And um, a lot of those stressors, the reason I keep talking about work and money and, and those kinds of things is because that's obviously, not obviously, but I'm sure obvious to many of you, one of the, or, or potentially the most, in, um, the biggest stressor or one of the biggest sources of stress, money and finances and job and career, are two of the biggest stressors and sources of stress for men. Um, part of the reason, without getting into this, um, is that you know the structure, that it, the context that we live in, that's associated with being black, um, is one where we're faced with a bunch of. We have to put more energy and effort into things to sometimes achieve the same outcomes as others, and there's a lot more. Um, obstacles in our way and we have to obviously put I can put more energy into things to be as successful financially in the same things um, professionally and that those things you know we black men don't make the same amount of money if given the same level of education and and success or even status within a particular company if you look at them nationally and just overall on average that you tend to have even with the same level of education the same level of performance that you know, black people in general and black men, and compared to other men, tend to uh, fare worse. Black women tend to fare worse than black men in the financial realm as well. But we also part of the reason this is important for black men is because we tend to judge black men as men often through how much are they contributing or are they contributing financially to a household? Do they have a job? It's, it defines men in a different way than it necessarily does for women. Um, for black women versus black men. And obviously this has changed some over time, but we still, if you think about the biggest critiques that we have of men, it's often around how are they, or are they taking care of the financial responsibilities that they have? Are they invested in taking care of their families and so forth? Are they connected to those? Are they, you know, and so there's this combination of things that is how we judge men as men and that we have to, that we're trying to juggle and balance and manage. And so part of the question here is really, what are you aiming for? You know, yes, you could be aiming for health, but often, you know, you're aiming to be successful in terms of financially, you're aiming to be, have a successful career, um, you're certainly trying to manage uh, a relationship and a marriage if you're so blessed. Um, to manage a household and family, and certainly thinking about your spiritual development, or certainly we say that we're prioritizing that, but we usually don't put as much energy into that as we do our careers, money, and the other things that are um, that are part of the secular world that we live in. And so the part of what I'm trying to say is that we have to strike a better balance between these issues. And so, let me put this in the context. COVID has just exacerbated these things a, a bit more, made these things worse. You know, obviously the pandemic is something that has taken over our lives very much. And it's important to recognize that men have been dying at higher rates of COVID than women since the beginning of the pandemic. And that was the case in China and Italy when the first cases came out in early 2020. And um, that's been the case throughout the pandemic here in the U.S. and for the most part across the globe. And when we've broken this out more recently by race and ethnicity, we know that black and Hispanic men have had higher rates of death and mortality during the time of COVID. If you did, this is looking at the difference in life expectancy between 2019 and 2020, the, the, the year, you know, the first middle school year of the, of the pandemic. And so what it's saying here is that black men and Hispanic men have been dying at far higher rates during this period than they had been before. To put this in some context, life expectancy or how long you can expect to live from when you were born has tended to go up pretty much every year um, over the last almost 100 years. And so, um, what was that? Okay. 
over the last approximately 100 years. And so it's important to, to recognize that, um, that there's a gender component to this that, that is also important, important in this picture and that being um, black or brown and male also leads to potentially worse health outcomes. Um, if I want to show you sort of the, the, how long you expect to live from, from when you were born um, from 100 years ago, it's the same case that black men were less likely to live um, as long as their black female counterparts or, or their white male counterparts. And so the point here is that the stress of COVID and the other things associated with COVID have made it have piled on top of the other challenges and so forth that we're already facing with managing the the, the challenges that we have, challenge the obstacles that come with being black in our society, and that we have a lot that's on our plate. So what I'm trying to do is simply not to crush you, but simply to acknowledge and to bring to your, you know, bring to the front of your experience that to have kind you of pause for a minute and recognize, hey, there's a lot that we're dealing with. And I think we've tried to sort of push it to the back and not really recognize how much we're actually dealing with and experiencing in COVID and all of these other things that are happening. But we do need to take a moment to realize how much stress that we're under. And that those things, in addition to all of the other things that are, that are you know, going on with needing to pay mortgage, to, you know, do all these other things that are important in our lives, that this has made it more stressful. And so we have to recognize this and do a better job of balancing those issues. One of the other things that's related to men that we found um, in some other work is that broadly, um, this isn't unique to black men, that men tend to have uh, fewer sort of social connections and outlets. Um, men have had higher rates of depression um, and depressive symptoms, I should say, not depression and suicidal ideation um, associated with the pandemic. And so suicidal ideation is simply thinking about suicide and thinking about whether or not that's something they would they would try to do. Um, and depressive symptoms versus the diagnosis of depression just means you may have more sadness, um, difficulty concentrating, um, actually overwork and, and you know basically can be another sort of source of or uh, symptom of depression. Um, one of the things in other work that we found for men in depression can be irritability um, and having anger outbursts or just having a, a, a lower threshold for when you're sort of going to lash out at people and, and, and engage in those kind of behaviors. That for men, depression may not always just look like sadness and with being withdrawn and um, depressed in the very traditional sense. That Depression for men can look like, you know, a, a lot of these more externalizing things, and we need to consider that depression looks different for men as well. And so uh, COVID, in the context that we've lived in in that period, has really made these things just, again, made these things even more salient and, and just given us more reason to have more stress, and that those things are associated with the depressive symptoms and suicidal ideation, which is part of the depressive symptoms. If you add to that the financial strain that's come with COVID and you know just the job losses and the, the extra work for those who have maintained jobs and so forth that we've seen during COVID, that the pandemic has also contributed, the financial strain associated with that has also contributed to difficulty sleeping. You've seen more alcohol and substance use, um, the wearing and tearing in terms of chronic disease and chronic, you know, the, for those of us who have heart disease or diabetes or something like that, that those things have gotten worse because of the amount of stress that we're under, because we're now more limited in how we can cope with those things outside of the healthcare system. So your ability to do things like socialize with folks to get some opportunity to relax and so forth and to hang out with friends, maybe watch a game, um, those kinds of things have been limited severely by the pandemic and we have to recognize that those outlets have been taken away from us and that those ways of relieving stress, those healthy ways of relieving stress have been taken away and for some have leaned more on the unhealthy ways that are more um, things that people can do sort of on their own. Eating would be another one, um, excessive eating, particularly things that uh, feel good like high fat foods, high sugar foods and so forth. 
Um, and then reduce motivation um, to do things like remain physically active, to eat healthy foods and so forth, because you know, we live in a world, or I still am living, you know, professionally in a world where, you know, for the most part, I'm still at home, I'm still, um, you know, doing most things via Zoom. And um, so it's not really the same motivation to get out of the house and exercise and do those kinds of things and take care of myself. So the last part of this is what I'm going to encourage. So I've given you a lot of the problems. Now what I'm saying to you is how do we, what are some things that we can do um, to manage these kinds of issues? And one of the things that I'm saying here is that, again, I'm not trying to say put all of those other things that we prioritize in life and that we expect men to do and that you expect of yourself and that I'm sure fathers and uncles and grandfathers have been trying to instill in you as values since, you know, you were um, very small. That those things are very much important and you have to do those things. What I am saying is that you also have to prioritize your own health, your own well-being, and do things that help you make sure that you recharge, that you have the energy to do those things that are important to you. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to do them. That's the simple point here. And so whether it's making sure that you continue to have an active prayer life, whether you recognize and need to when you are no longer sort of functioning at a point where you can benefit from professional um, counseling, talking with someone, whether it's within your church and talking to a pastor within your church or um, someone within your church or needing to go outside of that for um, like to a psychologist, psychiatrist, um, social worker, or some other type of mental health professional to really recognize that those things do have power and importance and um, those things are really important for us to try to do and take care of ourselves. It's not a, a threat to or suggesting that you're not a man by doing those kind of things. Actually, it facilitates you being able to do the things that, you're, that are important to you. So it's important to try to reframe that idea that seeking help is bad. Seeking help in this case is actually going to help you do all the things that you want to be remembered for, that you want to do, and that are important to you. Um, building connections and making sure that you have a supportive community of like-minded men and um, that you, you know, surround yourself with positive men who are also trying to live a positive life, who are trying to center their faith in their lives and so forth and do things um, and live their lives in this way and not just sort of stay connected to, you know, family, friends and so forth who, you know, maybe from the past, maybe, you know, you obviously um, they, they may be important to you, but for your, it's important to also build connection with those who are, who are going the places that you're going, who are thinking the way that you're thinking, and that are making sure that they are feeding into you and you're able to feed it to them, and build support and accountability around those kinds of things to try to take care of yourself and others. And again, it's really important to know when and where, you know, these things come. And that taking care of yourself you know, it's important to recognize what's your responsibility and what really needs to be done and dealt with by a professional. And so, yeah, taking care of yourself, making sure that you sleep adequately, eat healthy food, exercise, um, take care of ailments and so forth when you have them, you know, manage your stress, take care, you know, meditate, pray, you know, have an active prayer life and so forth. All of those things are important to take care and do it yourself. But there are also things to recognize that you can't see and you can't know until you actually go to the doctor. Your body can't tell you, you know, you won't necessarily feel and know without going to the doctor, you know, how your heart is functioning, whether or not there are cells growing out of control that could eventually lead to cancer, whether or not there are other things that need to manage within your body and within your that within your cognitive functioning that would also be important to be able to capture. Is it just that you're you know, quote unquote, getting old, or is it something more that's actually going on that you really need to care to, to have a professional um, work with you on to manage? And so, taking care of yourself has to include all of those things, not just you taking care of yourself, but also making sure that you do have a relationship with healthcare providers and try to make sure that they are you're seeing them on a regular basis, even for preventive care, not just waiting until things are really bad. And so this idea of self-care with black men 
um, is something that is taking on, you know, for is, is beginning to get some attention. Um, Common um, is, you know, a, a popular figure rapper um, who has really embraced this um, and really tried to prioritize this and, and promote this within black men um, and really try to help um, encourage black men to engage in those kind of healthy behaviors. So what I try to do today is sort of to go through these things and talk about sort of the challenges and the messages that we get around what success is, what it could be, and how that and what that what health is, and how black men tend to think about health and how we tend to prioritize health, and then some of the barriers, of course, to prioritizing health and finding a balance between health and taking care of these things that are important to us and to our families. And then talk about some ideas briefly about how we can take better care of ourselves um, as men. And so just in closing, um, it's important to remember that yes, we're important, but we're not indispensable. Um, it's important to recognize that while, you know, your family needs you um, and you need to be there, and so you can't be there if you're not healthy, if you're not taking care of yourself, and if you're not doing the things for yourself, um, there, you have to do those kinds of things um, to be there, to be able to be indispensable, or try to actually fulfill those roles and responsibilities that you have within your family. But that, you know, your family's going to have to go on without you or with you, and so it's important to recognize that those, you know, they don't, you don't want to have to have them make those choices. That we can't often see when we have these kind of stressors in our lives, um, how we're actually going to manage them or what their, their purpose and plan for and clearly your pastor and uh, ministry team can speak more to this and more eloquently to this than I can but that you know the, the way that you understand what you're dealing with and the challenges that you have in your life and the ways that you're trying to define success and so forth you can't always see God's plans clearly but it's important to recognize that there's a balance between doing your part and letting God do his part and finding a balance between just doing those things and being comfortable with letting God do the rest. And so the last thing is just a reminder that, you know, you never know who's watching you. And that as much as you may teach people by what you say, there's often, you know, more lessons that are coming from what you do. And so this last quote is, the father said to his son, be careful where you walk. His son replied, be careful, you be careful, I walk in your footsteps. So do remember that regardless of what you're saying, people are watching what you're doing and modeling themselves after what you're doing. So it's important to leave that legacy of health and health promotion and a lifestyle of health promotion for the next generation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Griffin, for an enlightening uh, understanding of where we are. And with that, um, I don't know if there are questions or if questions, comments, thoughts. Yes, can you, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Griffin, for your enlightening understanding of where we are with men's health and public health. Um, Thank you so much, Dr. Griffin, for your understanding and your acknowledgement of where we are in men's health today. This, at this time, um, we'd like to know if there's any questions here from the Witherspoon Sanctuary as to, to Dr. Griffin of what you might have thought of listening or reflecting on his message and how it pertains into your life. Did you have any questions this morning?
welcome Dr. Moore. Uh, once again, uh, thank you, Dr. Griffin, for uh, that outstanding uh, presentation. And uh, I personally got uh, some reminders about uh, looking outside myself. Looking outside myself uh, for uh, help and support. So uh, my question is this. Now, we are here as a group, and I think we feel a certain amount of group support. What would be your advice in terms of ongoing um, effective mental health maintenance? And if I don't know if you can type that in that question in to him. Okay. Suggestions for ongoing um, uh, mental health support mechanisms. So the question was about um, suggestions for ongoing mental health. Is that um, things you can do to take care? Ah, okay. So I think you know mental health is is one of those things where um, it's very individual because you have to find something that you you know can give you a bunch of things, but you've also got to figure out which of those things work for you. So I think one of the things, like I said, that um, COVID has taken away from us has been a lot of the typical ways that men um, got together socially um, around things like sports and so forth or in barbershop and so forth where you could just, you know, have some time for fellowship and connection and so forth. So I think we don't want to, part of mental health is also feeding that connection, that social support, that social opportunity to engage with other men and to have those kind of relationships. Um, I think other things, again, just taking care, you know, I think part of, part of one of the things for me in terms of mental health more specifically is also, you know, making sure that you stay active, um, staying, you know, being able to um, engage in some regular type of physical activity, walking, walking, you know, 20, 30 minutes a day, um, you actually has real um, positive implications for mental health. Um, it's actually when it's actually been presented as almost an alternative to um, psychiatric medication for depression. Um, obviously, there are challenges with that. Um, you know, if you're depressed, you're far less likely to be motivated to want to get up and walk. But you know, those kinds of activities and so forth are um, things to just make sure that you do. Um, the other thing I would say that is surprisingly simple that's important for your mental health is adequate sleep. Um, you know, we don't really always appreciate how much uh, what happens in our sleep and we're starting to uh, recognize, um, particularly as it relates to heart disease, how important sleep is for um, helping to uh, help your heart to, to function and help your body to recharge. Um, on a daily basis and how important that is just for your overall health and, and well-being. Um, so I think even just those basic things of being, staying active, um, you know, making sure that you get active sleep, staying connected to um, other men and just people in your lives um, that, that, you know, from a social standpoint, um, doing things that help you keep your priorities in order. Um, so again, having a prayer life and having a meditation life um, is also really important. Um, there's a question in here about how big of a role can meditation, meditation take in our lives. I mean, I, I mean, I think it's hard to overstate. It depends on how you're, 
you know, prayer and meditation often can go together. Um, you can certainly do them separately, but thinking about, you know, what you meditate on or are you just meditating to sort of clear your head and finding that balance um, is part of the, the challenge and finding those things that you're willing to do consistently and maintain as a lifestyle is part of what we're trying to promote here. And so to maintain that mental health balance is really the art of making sure that you're doing, you're finding something that works for you and that you actually find benefit in and hopefully actually that you find that you may even enjoy. So if you don't find some enjoyment in what you're doing, you're not going to typically, or some benefit to it or some something that you actually feel like makes it worth you doing, you're not probably going to maintain it. So you have to see, we have to, for a lot of things to maintain them, we have to see the benefits actually be there and see how they actually are benefiting. So I think recognizing, you know, those kind of very basic things like, uh, again, prayer, meditation, sleep, um, healthy eating, and just recognizing how you feel very differently and your body feels different and you actually tend to be, you know, mentally clearer when you're eating healthier than when you're not. You have more energy. Um, staying active, I mean, all of those basic things that are about your overall physical health also speak to your mental health. So, so I think also prioritizing in terms of, again, managing stress and being able to structure your life and say no. Um, this is certainly one of the things that I don't do well, I'll be honest with you, but it is a really important thing to know how to not over, not to overfill your plate with activities and to not take on too much because then you're not able to find the space to have that space for meditation, have that space to take care of yourself, have that space to make sure that you get adequate sleep, adequate rest, invest and pour into your relationship with the spouse, with your kids, with family members, with your church, and in a social way. So it's, it's really, you know, how those things are playing out. Uh, there's a question here, uh, COVID is having a huge impact on African American men. Do you have specific data on the impacts? Um, beyond the fact that, at least in the first half of 2020, um, black men were dying from COVID um, um, at far higher rates than everyone else. Our life expectancy drops, you know, more than other groups of men. Um, there's, again, sort of the um, Black men and Hispanic men had the highest rates of mortality from COVID. A lot of the stressors, um, so one of the things I should say as it relates to COVID is you gotta remember sort of COVID also co-occurred with all of the things like George Floyd murder, Black Lives Matter, and so it's, there's a lot going on in our society that adds to the stress that we're experiencing. And so it's hard to tease out COVID from those other things as well. Um, do I have specific data on, say, you know, other health issues, um, job loss, certainly with greater and black men? Um, I don't have a lot of other specific data other than the big picture. Our rates of mortality were far greater um, than, than others, unfortunately. Ooh, great question. What's the role of the church, especially the black church, in continuing this work in our communities? Well, I mean, as you, as you well know, um, you preach it to the choir as it were, as it were. Um, you know, the church has been there from the beginning uh, to fill the gaps that other systems in our society, the, the you know, health system, you know, government system policies and programs that we have at a larger level are not. And so the church has to be that place, continue to be that place where those needs that we have as a black community are getting filled, filled, and and um, and fed and addressed. Um, I think the role of the black church in terms of mental health is hopefully to help normalize it. Um, one of those key roles that um, the black church has is it sets the tone for our culture and for our community around what's important and how to understand things. And so when it's supported, endorsed, and promoted by the church, um, it tends to carry a lot of weight within the community. So if we recognize that mental health is something that is normal, is something that is just part of being human, 
that you know one of the actually depression, for example, is the number one source of disability uh, in the world. Um, it's you know, and so recognizing that those kinds of things are important, you know, to help normalize, and that getting mental health treatment is something that we should promote, encourage, support, and that the church being one of those vehicles to help people recognize that. And, and to not to, to basically reduce the stigma of things like um, depression, seeking help for mental health issues, seeking counseling, seeking support is something that I think could be a key role for the church. So, Lord, let's say the young black men as we're now starting our lives, careers, families, while balancing generational pressure and markers of success. Um, one of the things that I would say is make sure you understand what you be clear about your goals and be clear about what's important to you and you know we do a lot of exercises in, in church that will help you to sort of say well you know people say well, what's your priority of course they say oh my relationship with God and my family and so forth and then you'll look at well where do you spend your time and we'll see that those things are not aligned and that may not be possible always to align the amount of time, but you can align them in terms of priorities. You can make sure that you start your, your day with prayer, make sure that you have these kind of balances and that you invest in parts of your life where you're saying that you're, you have these values that you're saying, and clearly by you being here, you're saying that your faith is potentially part of that and is part of that. I would say that making sure that you um, recognize what success really means to you and for you. Is it going to be having this car? Is it going to be living in this neighborhood, living in this size house, wearing these particular kinds of clothes, having your kids or family wear these clothes? Is that really what's going to define you and success? Or is it going to be the happiness, the, the educational success, the having careers that of, of choice for your family as opposed to having to just accept whatever jobs are available? So making sure that you live your life along with the values and priorities that are important to you and you start setting that tone, that foundation from the beginning. It's harder to shift something than it is to, to do it from the beginning. Um, support the mental health of, uh, well, what are the ways that men can support the mental health of others both peer-to-peer -peer and across generations? And yeah, I think one of those is, one of the ways is to normalize asking about how, we, you know, when we ask the, the comment, oh, how you doing, that you actually mean it, and you actually stop and say, no, 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 really, I'm not, this is not just a, a, yeah, a saying hello, another way of saying hello, that you really mean, how are you actually doing, how are you doing in different parts of your life, how are you doing with work, how are you doing with your family, how are you doing with your spouse, and really get them to develop relationships where you have the opportunity that you you develop those trusting and trusted relationships with people, with other men that you can confide in, that you can look to, that can help check you and be like, look, man, I don't know what you're doing, but you you're not doing it right over in this area of your life. That you you know you're not sort of um, you know that they, they they can provide that accountability to you and that you listen to you know men in. Um, certainly other gen older generations and listen to the, the fact that they have experience and a perspective that um, those of us who are younger don't have. Um, as I'm getting older, I'm, I'm recognizing, you know, the perspective that I have for my nephews who are now in college and, you know, sharing basic things with them about, you know, how to think about priorities and so forth. I think all of those things are really important, but to have those for peers to listen to, but also it's it's important for those who are, are younger to listen to those who are older because there's something about experience and the wisdom that comes with that um, that we don't always appreciate, but that can really help to reconfigure how we think about success and priorities and so forth. Ooh. Uh, the shared so the question is what's the shared responsibilities of our partners in the journey to health? And can we create boundaries with our significant others that don't separate us? Um, well, first of all, I would say that you, it, it, a lot, historically, or generally, in the black community, and in, in uh, the U.S. in general, but certainly in the black community, I think it's fair to say that in most black families, women are the ones who are 
um, primarily the ones who are taking care of the health and well-being of the family. That if men go to, you know, often they're the ones who are taking care of, you know, food rolls, if you will, doing the shopping, for, you know, preparing food, making sure that the food is healthy, even if they're not the ones preparing it. There's sort of the checks and balances, making sure that everybody's going to the doctor, the dentist, you know, doing those kind of things, checking out the well-being and stress of everybody in the family, checking on them and so forth. So they are sort of women and, and partners in our lives are the balances and checks. And we don't, as much as we appreciate it, we usually do appreciate it. We don't sort of like it sometimes, but it's still an important part of who we are. And how to do that in the context of a relationship is something that you have to work out. And uh, certainly I would leave that to your, your various ministries, how to strike that balance and how to do that. Um, of how to, you know, have an open and how to communicate effectively about that. A lot of, one of the things we've done in our work is some of the things that um, women would do to change things for the health and well-being of men in their lives, they wouldn't actually tell them they were doing, they would just do it. And the, the men would sort of um, push back on that, I could say, it's the gentlest way I can say it, um, because they didn't appreciate not knowing that they were doing something uh, that was supposed to be in their best interest, even though they were doing it for them, they didn't like the fact that they weren't part of that decision. So how, I guess the point is, you have to find some way to communicate about that openly and not just do these things um, on either side, for men to just do stuff and to not communicate, and for women to just do stuff and not communicate, even if it's in the spirit and best interest of each other. For men approaching their 60s, great ways to stay physically active. Again, find something that you like. Um, you know, I went to a new area. I really enjoyed walking um, in a park here that's near a river, and so I get to see the skyline of the city and um, water and those kinds of things in other places. I found other places to walk. I mean, if you play sports or have played sports and so forth, um, doing basic things like, you know, um, doing some kind of resistance exercise for men in those, in those age groups and continuing, even if it's basic things like push-ups, um, those kinds of things um, can really be, or, or um, squats not with weight, but just, you know, literally, you know, going up and down, squatting up and down, those kinds of things to build the larger muscle group and to work on those can really be important um, as forms of resistance exercise to build up the muscles in the joints because those are the things that usually end up going. But just something basically that keeps you moving. Um, the other thing with men approaching the 60s, I would say, is stretching. Um, and to make sure that you, because if you notice sort of, you know, when you get those aches and pains and twists and twinges, that one of the first things you have to do is find, you know, is, is relieve that. And so if you actively make stretching and flexibility part of your daily routine from just when you wake up or take a few minutes to do that, that those kinds of things can be really helpful. Um, so some of the other good Christian education materials that have come across to speak to the topic of men, wellness, wholeness, and faith. Um, the first person whose work comes to mind for me is Tony Dungy. Um, I'm a huge Tony Dungy fan. I would say, you know, he's written a lot about um, his, from everything from his daily devotional to, he has several books that are um, talking about sort of um, wholeness, wellness, um, and those kind of factors. I mean, I have to think about others. I know, um, you know, a lot of folks, I haven't, I'm not as familiar with personally Tony Evans' works and so forth, but. Um, you know, my, um, there's a comment for me to, um, so my books aren't really, and my work is not really, you know, for, um, it, it's not really practical. <laughs> um, you know, my, our men's health equity book is out there, it's really more of a handbook and a resource for, um, for the research community and practice community to understand how to think about issues related to men's health and have that. Um, if you're interested in this idea of racism, I know it's really contentious. We have a book called Racism, Science and Tools for the Public Health Professional um, to, to push this idea that 
you know, this discussion of racism, we try to leave it in a sort of political, very charged sort of place, but we're recognizing as a health community the importance of understanding racism and what it really means for, as a way to understand the limitations that come with being a person, you know, of African descent or being Native American and other marginalized groups in our society, and how those things are, how are the challenges that we face are, are real, and the structures that we face are real challenges, and we have to really find a better way to manage and balance those issues. Um, some of the things that I've written, we actually, I, I, I should send this to the group, and I'll send it to um, Mr. Barry. Um, there's a piece that we did that was, they got picked up a lot in the media um, a few years ago, um, and I, I skipped over it in one of the slides. But it was basically about um, this, the idea that we didn't grow up for Father's Day a few years ago, um, that men often care for their children uh, essentially better than they do for themselves. And while that's not terribly a surprise, um, the idea that we don't that we don't sort of strike a balance between um, you know taking care of ourselves and taking care of other responsibilities that we you know really need to recognize that. So. I think we're at the end of time. Um, so I want to say thank you. I don't know if uh, Josiah, if you're coming back on um, to close us out or, or what. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Griffin, for a instrumental understanding of men's health and how we navigate for African-American men as well as all men of color. Um, we've, you've answered so many questions and I had one up there. You touched on it as well. Um, we'll look forward to getting those materials from Mr. Barry and we'll disseminate them throughout our congregation and others who reach out to us. Um, thank you so much. You have a wonderful weekend. Be certain to go to church tomorrow and have a good week. Let us give Dr. Griffith another hand for that wonderful and inspiring. I am like Elder Walden. I too had many questions up there. To Deacon Barry and to uh, the Barry family, let's give them a hand for bringing this great resource to us. And even for those of you online, I saw Dr. Peggy uh, Dilworth Anderson uh, online as well. Thank you to the whole crew all over the nation uh, for bringing this great resource. Deacon Barry, I think we have an annual event on our hands. Blessings to you. Godspeed. So again, I am thankful to all of you who are online, for those who are here in the sanctuary. We have been both inspired and informed. And let us all strive in our own way to continue to think deeply and broadly about our wellness. We know that even within the scriptures, Jesus speaks of and models what it means to be whole. And oftentimes we forget that these two conversations are really one. Even in the life of Jesus, we find these moments, Gethsemane being one of them, when we find Jesus having to steal away to remove himself from the work of redemption, to recenter his heart. Time and time again, we find him eating with friends, breaking bread. All of these things that we oftentimes do not reflect upon how they can teach and inspire our living. And so our faith and our health are not necessarily separated. And so the more we fudge that line and look at the sacred text as a guide can also help inspire us as we live our full lives and continue to seek the will of God. 
I want to offer a prayer today as we leave this place that we continue to think deeply, broadly about how we love ourselves and love those around us, particularly as men and as fathers and as pillars within our community, how we begin to have these conversations, these methods of care. As one question said, both peer-to-peer -peer and cross-generationally, as we begin to tear down many of the isms and schisms within our community and begin to reverse many of the negative impacts, certainly life has and continues to affect us all, but together with a mindful and steadfast heart, with information and inspiration, we may be able to live our best lives. I also want to thank Minister Josiah McCruston, who is representing our AV ministry, for connecting us to the world today. We Thank you for your sacrifice and for your hard work. Let us all pray, beloved. God of health and wellness, God of wholeness, God of oneness, we honor your presence this day. God of rest and work, God of planting and reaping, God of frenzy and pause, God of peace, God of stillness, bless us now. As we have heard and have been informed, may we find the urgency to apply that which we now know to our daily lives, to our practices, as we honor these temples, O oh Lord, that you have given to us that our mental health and our physical health and our spiritual health become a priority, that we take the first steps in small yet intentional ways to bring our lives into alignment with your will for us. God, we know from the scriptures that your will is for us to live vibrant and purpose-filled lives and help us to do that intentionally. When it is time to pause, give us the courage to stop. And in our well-intentioned manner to say yes, may we always remember that we too are a priority of our own care. As we strive to love and care for others, may we not lose ourselves in the eclipse of wanting to be and wanting to stand in the gap for those whom we love. In all things, O oh Lord, we bless your name. Now as we leave this place, O oh Lord, but never from your presence, continue to inspire our hearts and challenge our hands. Continue to allow this sacred place, O oh Lord, to be a convening place in this world where both the mind and the spirit and the body are all priorities of sacred care, where we tend to all three just the same. For just as you are God in three persons, we too must tend to the trinity of our dimensions, both mind, body, and our spirit, belong to you. So now, gracious Lord, now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. We who are faithful say amen. God bless you all in Jesus' name.